So, Giles, welcome. Um, we're delighted to have you as part of the SATAA webinar series. Um, I've known Giles for many years as a fellow educator and a, a friend, and I think back particularly to the South African TA conference in 2008. I think that's where you did your TSDA exam. Yeah, 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 I remember that. Yeah, very good fun. Oh, that was and a really good, that was a really good couple of days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're delighted that you're part of our association and uh, offering this webinar. So it's over to you. Thank you very much, Karen, and welcome to everybody. Hello. Um, I, I'm very, uh, I was really uh, pleased to be invited to contribute to the program. I'm aware that this is quite a a, a new initiative and the opportunity to, to join you is uh, it's one I've been looking forward to. Um, so thanks for having me and thanks for inviting me, Karen. Um, and I do remember very fondly that, that conference in, in Johannesburg. I had my daughter with me as well and she still talks of it today. She reckons she had her best ever steak sandwich in Johannesburg. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, anyway, that's enough of that. I, um, I've, I've obviously gathered uh, a sense of where people are at the moment just geographically and obviously I can um, see your names here and I guess that's, uh, that's our final person, I guess, just joining us. Yeah, Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Um, and what I wanted to do was to give us a little time to settle into the session um, and just to um, talk a little bit about what we'll cover in the session. Um, I'm assuming that uh, Karen sent the article on Educator as Cultivator before, this, um, before this, this call. And I'm going to assume that you've had some time to have at least glanced at it. Um, and some of you may have had the opportunity to do more, more thorough reading of it. Um, but I'm, I'm really looking at, at talking about the topics associated with that and any curiosities that you have. And also, I'm open to where we might end up um, on the back of your curiosity and interest. So that's, my, that's where I'm at right now. Um, I think it's quite an interesting paper to be having for this session because if I look out my window right now, I can see the field where my sheep are currently having their lambs. Um, we are in the early stages of it at the moment. There are, there are just nine lambs running around um, and we have most of them to come. And so I think there's something quite, um, quite present about looking at this paper um, and the idea of cultivation, um, for me anyway, at this particular time of year. Um, and I thought what, what I'd be interested to do, and um, I know Karen will be able to sort this out technically in just a moment, is just to um, ask you in with a partner here to have some some share some thoughts as to what has brought you to this particular workshop what curiosity are you bringing um, it may be a seed that you have a seed of an idea or a seed of a question um, that you are hoping might germinate during this uh, process so um, I, it would be helpful for me to get some sort of connection with the interest that you're bringing to this. And it may well be you, that you have a question about, uh, a specific question about the, the article. It may be a more general question about your clients. It may be a question uh, to me about, um, about myself. Um, but I just wanted to uh, give you a couple of minutes to kind of settle into this process and for me to settle in with you. Um, so, so Karen, do you, do you know, can you do what you need to do now to set that up? Yeah, I think what I need to do, um, how long do you want them to be in their breakout rooms? Well, maybe just four minutes. That's a couple of minutes each. Um, so a fairly okay. short period of time, if that's okay. Right. So I'm going to click to go into your rooms. You'll find yourself on a screen with another person. I'm going to join <laughs> one because there's somebody on their own and Giles will be on because he what doesn't do need I to do? join it. So I just look I'll, around. I'll call you back in four minutes. Giles, you'll just watch I your lambs. Look out, I can look out for my lambs. Yeah, okay. Right, thanks. Cheers. Right, okay. Wow. 
Right. So I'm going to join Andrew's group. Uh, Sharon, you've got to join the group. Yeah. I think I'm lost. <laughs> Where I need to go. Um, did you get an invitation from Karen Tomoko? Yeah. Then, so have you pressed the join group? I did, but um nothing, okay. nothing <laughs> So somebody else could be looking for you, Tomoko. Yes, she was. Um, Who? I have no idea how to get you back. Yeah. Was it Anche? Yes, hi, I'm back. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I was alone in my okay. breakout room. I don't think that was the point of the exercise. So uh, it's Tomoko and Anche, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, so I will, I will mute me, myself. So you guys can carry on talking without me listening in. I think that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. Hi, Tomoko. Hi, and and TJ. Antia. Antia. Antia, that's it. And TJ and Tomoko. Um, do we supposed to talk about uh, how we expect what we expect about this? session mm. or idea mm. or something mm. okay. um would you like to go first i don't mind you start if you okay. are ready okay um uh, i read the article and i just wanted to know one thing more about the figure one he had a diagram about uh, uh teaching method. So that's what I want to know. Mm. Basically. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. What what prompts that question? What's 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 behind that question for you? Oh the uh he talked about the um the educator as a cultivator is mixture of um radical teaching model and uh, liberal and um, was that humanistic models and mm -hmm. i couldn't make an image of those things very ah. well so i'd like to know what's um he he's all he explained uh the two things about the education and the cultivation so uh, clearly so i want him to explain about this in the, in his way for me mm. to understand better. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Very lovely. Mm. Hi, Karen. Hi there. You? I'm just um, trying to multitask because someone said they didn't get the ID for the session. Um, so I just want to email her that and then I'm going to. Oh, okay. Um, bring everyone back together. Put 
So we came back to the Okay, so everyone's now got a notification that their room will end in, well, 60 seconds. So right, okay, okay. joining us again. Does that mean somebody else will join us as well then, Karen? Um, yeah, Raji should join us. I'm not sure why she didn't get to but I've just sent her the link and the meeting number. So, um, and um, Antia, how long, how much earlier do you need to leave just to give us an idea of the vision of groups? Sorry, Karen? I'm just asking Antia. I'm, I'm hoping one o'clock, Karen. I'm not 100%. Okay, so you with us for another 45 minutes. Okay. Um, so, everyone's back. back. Everyone's back. Okay. So what I'd like to do is um, not necessarily, not everyone has to speak, but if you need to, then, then that's fine as well. But I'd be really interested to just get a, an early sense of what curiosity people are bringing to the, the session. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a piece of Thanks, Alex. I'm quite um, interested because of a current experience I'm having with a group of clients um, in groundedness. Um, and how that integrates with other aspects of um, process with clients and how a, a coach or any kind of practitioner does groundedness um, and how that impacts the client. Yeah, 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 okay. On a transactional level. Yeah, okay, thanks, Alex. Yeah, it's a good one for starters. Thank you. Yeah. Who else has got a, a curiosity or a question? Well, I mean, for me, um, you know, as I was saying to Alex, um, it's... Um, I tend to I tend to be quite strong in the thinking, feeling um, dimensions, you know, and the physical, the groundedness, the um, um, the sense of that. From what I read in your in your article, is something that um, seriously attracts me, you know, draws me. Um, for you know, there's something about being grounded as as well as open. So. It's like being being open without being spacey. <laughs> it's a way that I could personally verbalize it. <laughs> Just say that again. It's how to be <laughs> open without being spacey. That's right. Yeah, you know, without going too too sort of head and 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 heart. And sort of just really allowing things to yeah, emerge. Lovely. That's how I'm lovely. seeing it, you know, in yeah. a very real way. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else with um, a, a similar or different thing? For me, the uh, idea of uh, cultivating clients is means more responsible than what I am now. So I would like to learn and then still be free. So I see. It. Right. Saravan, <laughs> so you're hearing a, a responsibility that comes through. Yes, yeah. more responsible than what I'm now. That is something I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Great. Yeah, yeah. Query on responsible. So, 
Oh, I love, yes, yes, yeah. Oh my goodness, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. Gosh, yeah, any, any others out there? Yeah, Tomoko. Yeah, um, I'm interested in your article, especially the figure one. You kind of shows the learning theory. Yeah. Can you explain that um, theories using your um, cultivation? Yeah, I just want to, I missed uh, what you were saying there, Tomoko. Just uh, um, in figure one, was it, did you say? Yeah figure one and uh, i'd like to know more about it yeah that's okay okay that's, uh, a real specific question there yeah i'm just getting my copy of the article here sorry, that's all. That because you're a mixture of radical and like uh liberal and humanistic yeah 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 okay yeah. so to talk a little bit more about that okay yeah, that's very interesting for me thank yeah. you Okay, thanks, Tamoka. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else with anything else? And it's fine if you don't at this time. Um, okay. Um, if you do get any further questions, can you just interrupt and, and raise them um, as we go along? Um, that's um, there's some really rich invitation in in what you've already uh, suggested though, um, and my temptation is to launch straight in and respond to some, uh, those questions right now. But I want to resist that, and and really um, start to prepare the ground for the work that we'll do in this session. And having having started to consider the questions you've got. I am going to be asking you in a few minutes to be thinking about a client that you're working with that you're, you're perhaps maybe puzzled about, um, maybe a bit frustrated in the working with. Um, and then I want to talk in more detail around the, the, the business of the paper itself. Um, but before I, I ask you to think about a client, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about um, where that article came from. Um, the experience out of which it grew um, as a way of, if you like, setting up some of the theory involved within the paper. Um, and as, as you can probably gather from the introduction in the paper, um, although it's got a lot of detail around the business of um, farming, that's not my personal background. I very much came from a different kind of landscape. And that in moving into the countryside, I, I experienced quite a high level of uprootedness. So quite the opposite, if you like, of being grounded. And that um, what happened certainly initially was I felt as though there were two lives. One in which I was in a very grounded, in a very secure and certain role, which was that of my being an educator, which I knew that I had some competency with. I got lots of strokes and reinforcement for. And then there was this quite, separate way of life, which was becoming um, uh, more involved in the business of, of farming. And it felt very much like there were two distinct ways of, of, of living my life. Um, so it's quite a, a high level of disconnection. Um, and it was during the, the relationship with the old neighbor that those two aspects of, uh, that felt quite separate became integrated. And the notion of cultivation, the concept of cultivation, seemed to be, for me, the way in which that integration could be best described. Um, and so certainly I found it a process of renewal um, for myself as an educator. Um, it renewed both um, the person doing the educating, but also my, uh, my frame of reference around um, education too. Um, so that's just a, a kind of general backdrop to, to what I'm hoping to look at in more detail. I wondered though whether or not, um, rather than me speak about the paper, if you like, theoretically, whether or not it would be perhaps more relevant and more helpful if we had some real practice um, from your own experience um, to, if you like, graft 
the theory onto. Um, and, and to do that, I was going to ask whether or not we might have uh, another opportunity um, to break out and to, and you may have already started doing this, it sounds, with some of the paired activity, but I am going to be asking you to think about a client, could be a group process that you're currently working with, uh, or it might be an individual um, client. And uh, it's, it's, as I said earlier, it's a, a situation that you're a bit curious about, you might be frustrated about, um, it could be a bit of a puzzle to you. Um, it might be a, a group that you're only just beginning to work with and the curiosities are perhaps around the novelty of this new situation. Or it might be something that you're much more familiar with and maybe you're uh, frustrated or maybe even a little bored with the work um, and wondering where it might be going next. But uh, I just ask again then if you could have a little time um, and I, I think, Karen, I suggested this would be in threes. Um, if, the, if the numbers work out well, and we can do it in threes. Um, but just to, to have um, some time to clarify a question, um, well, not even a question, but an, it could be a question or an insight or um, a way of um, crystallizing a concern maybe around the, um, the client that you're working with. Can I just check if that's a clear enough task at this stage? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we're if we're in threes, um, then I, I think it would be useful having yeah you know, up to five minutes each on this. So um, Karen, if we can um, set it for uh, say fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then I, I won't take any questions on it. What I'll do is I'll start to talk about the ideas in the paper and encourage people to be thinking about how they overlay uh, with your situation. Is that okay for now? Yeah? Great. So there'll be new rooms of three. I'll be joining the rooms. Okay.
Oh, Roger. Hello? Hello? Is it Rajesh? Hello? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Raji, I've just ah. joined the main group again to, I saw Raji join the call yeah. and I allocated to the room I was in, but it didn't seem to work. Right. Um, but we're about to end them off anyway in about yeah. another minute. Yeah, yeah, that's fine.
Hi, Karen. Um, Hi, Rajesh. Hi. To elevate you to a, we were in breakout rooms and they, they're just coming back now. So um, you can join in, say, in the plenary. And um, yeah, Giles, meet Raji. Raji, meet Giles. Hi, Raji. Good to see you. Whereabouts in India are you? Sorry, I missed Sorry. that. I'm in Bangalore. Oh, lovely, 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 yeah. Very good. Mm. Oh, people coming back. Right. Okay. So, thank you. Um, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Rajesh has just uh, joined us as well. Uh, so, I think this will be us all now. Um, so, all of you are coming back now with uh, some discussion of a, a client that you are currently working with. And what I want to do first off is just talk a little bit about the model based on Howell's work um, on levels of competence. And then what I want to do is return to some of the more general questions uh, that you've raised, um, and particularly about groundedness. Um, and as I talk about these levels of competence, I, I'm going to encourage you to be thinking about the client that you've been talking about and consider whether or not and how it relates to the work that you're doing with uh, the client. Howells wrote, um, Howells was the first person to, to write about the idea of different levels of competency uh, during a process of learning. Um, and he did so in a book that um, is uh, called, called the, uh, the Empathic Communicator. It, it's not a, I, I don't find it a particularly accessible book. Um, I don't particularly enjoy reading it, um, but it is the, um, the source of uh, the work on levels of competence. In, in, he, he was not a transactional analyst, um, and it's the work of um, Petruska Clarkson, in um, the Achilles syndrome, um, where she takes hold of Howe's work and starts to use it in her work with clients. So um, Petruska Clarkson was very much a psychotherapist, but she developed a consultancy work with people that had, um, had high executive levels in, in, um, in corporations. Um, and so I guess you know, this was her using it more as a coach rather than a, a psychotherapist. And she took hold of Howe's earlier work and started to make sense of it in relation to script. And, and maybe I'll come back to that um, shortly. Um, I found myself intrigued about levels of competence in my own experience in learning how to be a farmer. And as you can see from the paper, um, I, I, I talk through my own experience of the, the four levels of competence. And what I'm interested in doing is making it even more explicitly uh, relevant in TA terms. And so I use the levels of discounting and accounting to, to make sense of it um, in a way that I certainly found more, more rich for myself. Um, and I've also found it very useful for when I overlay that model um, in relation to, to some of the, the people that I work with. And one of the one of the things that um, is clear from the outset is that when we start to learn something new, we start from a place of not knowing, of blissful ignorance, as uh, Petruska Clarkson refers to it. Uh, we, we come to the world not knowing um, what lies outside of us. And this is, this is quite a, 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 an important educational philosophical question. Um, and I think it's one also for those of us working as coaches as well, that what we may be doing in our role as coach or educator is we may well be in the process of interrupting the life of the other person with a view to involving them into a world that they would not have otherwise found. Um, and that's quite, um, that's quite a powerful philosophical Thing to be thinking about, um, let alone a very practical um, consideration. Um, and so, um, certainly, my the neighbour that uh, features in the in the in the story um, very much interrupted 
the stability and constancy of the world as I knew it and brought me to something that I would not have otherwise found. But the process itself always uh, involves a degree of disruption and of disturbance. And as you can see, there was, a, there was a, a situation in which I had been keeping some sheep out on a field and I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I had never um, kept sheep before. I came from the city, as I've already explained, and I really didn't know how to look after them. They were in the field, though, um, and the idea was that they would keep the grass well grazed. Looking back, I realized that they, they would never have been able to do that. The grass was far too woody. There was far too much of it and so on and so forth. Um, but the point is that there were sheep in the field. And on one particular occasion, I needed to gather them. And I became very frustrated as I tried to gather them. And uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't go where I needed them to go. And my frustration grew intense and, uh, and it was quite overwhelming and I became very angry about it. And I, I did all that I was able to do from a position of absolute ignorance. So there was no system, there was no um, understanding involved. Um, this was really working from a not knowing place. And what Howes noticed was that there is this shift that comes from uh, a place of blissful ignorance, of unconscious incompetence, to a position of suddenly realizing that there is so much that we don't know. And that this is a shift to what he referred to as conscious incompetence. And it is one which often generates um, strong feelings, strong feelings of anger or guilt or shame, and that this is um, of fundamental importance in the learning process. Um, it's what um, Jack Mesiro, um, who writes on transformational learning, what he refers to as the disorientating dilemma. There's um, a point at which I, there are aspects of the world that then become revealed to me. Um, in some respects, it's, it's where um, we come to the very edges of our script defenses um, in TA terms. Um, it's, it's about uh, bringing, a, bringing about a, a shift in the, uh, the frame of reference. Um, and consequently, it can provoke a very strong response for the individual. And that existential piece about life positions, about who's okay, who's not okay, um, really can come to the foreground. Um, and certainly in my experience on this particular day, I remember having a very, very strong sense um, that either I wasn't okay, or these sheep weren't okay, or this farming community weren't okay, um, but that there was a strong desire for me to want to just go back to the city, to go back to where everything was familiar, um, where I knew that there was some constancy and certainty. Um, and, and this is uh, a crucial piece in the development of the, uh, in, in my work as an educator, in the development of the, the student. But I think in terms of when I've worked as a coach, um, we, we can come across how a client is really reaching into this place of some disturbance. I just want to stop there for a moment and um, cast my eye around you to just see whether or not, am I teaching this clearly? Um, is this, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, am I teaching this clearly? Yeah, okay, nods are fine with me. Um, if I'm not, then... Um, this is an important point, and it's, it's especially important for online work. If you're beginning to feel uh, a little lost or confused, uh, I really want to encourage you to make the assumption that I'm not teaching this clearly enough. Um, that, um, so, so please make, a, make an interruption and get some clarity. I will just stop for a moment and see, are there any questions that have come to mind for you at this point, or shall I... Just carry on a little. Now's a good time if you have a question. Well, I don't know. I'm probably jumping the gun. But, I mean, my big thing there is the thing of safety, you know. Um, if somebody's, you know, particularly, well, 
people get so anxious at that at that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, you yeah. know, to have an existential um, and and to have your defenses um, yeah. um, challenged. You know, yes. Is, yeah. So I'm I'm just I'm just wondering about if you are going to be talking about safety there. Yeah. Thanks, Manny, because that's exactly where I was going now. <laughs> so, so you haven't jumped the gun. You have led me lovely. <laughs> um, so at this point in my own story, um, I can remember the, 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 um, the occasion very vividly uh, where I went back to the, uh, into my house. Um, I was cursing everything and everyone. Um, I was... Um, in a place of very, very much a not okay place. And my, uh, my wife um, said something very, very clearly. She said, go and speak to David. And as you can see in the paper, David was the, the neighbor who had really taken me on as his apprentice. And I stormed over to his house and swore and cursed about the impossibility of gathering the sheep of how what he needed to do was get his gun and we would have to shoot them because they had gone wild and no one was going to be able to do anything. And his response was twofold. Um, what he did on the one hand was he noticed my concern. He acknowledged that this can be really frustrating. And he also said there was something that could be done about it. I obviously did not believe there was anything that could be done about it because I had come to the outer perimeter of my understanding. Um, and what he did is he, he went out into the field. He was a very old man and he was very ill as well. And so he couldn't move very fast. He, he walked very slowly. And what he did is he took me alongside him into the field. And as he did so, he, he walked up to the sheep, which were now gathered at the far fence of the field. And he walked me and the sheep around the edge of the field. And he did two things. And this is really speaking to um, Manya's question about safety. What he continued to do was to acknowledge not just the frustration, but also um, that sense of hopelessness that we can sometimes arrive at when, for example, the animals don't do what you want them to do. Um, and he did something else as well. He said, and one day you will do this as well. And um, a phrase that I use is, is that at this stage, what we need most is someone who is able to, on the one hand, contain the disorientation, but even more crucially than that, can maintain hope when the client has lost sight of hope. And, and I, I think that's, um, I think that's a, a, a profoundly intimate act. Um, and it's that combination. So it's not either or. So the, there's the containment of the disorientation, which, he, which we do by acknowledging it, we name it. Um, for some clients, it might be important that we offer some degree of explanation or description if they, if, if they aren't able to find the words. Um, we, we help name this so it becomes known. It gets rendered into something that's potentially even manageable. But there is this second piece as well, which is holding out belief on behalf of the client, even though at this point they may well have lost sight of it. And I know, um, I know that uh, many of us would be familiar with solution focused or appreciative inquiry. And I feel I, I'm a, a real advocate of, of those techniques and, and that way of thinking. And I think there is a time where the level of disorientation is um, so significant that the, um, um, the, the rupture or the, uh, the, the, the negative experience needs to be noticed. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of any, 
too many future focused questions at this stage can seem as if the, uh, the coach or the educator has overlooked my, um, my, dis my disorientation. Um, and, and, uh, and, so, and so there's this combination, holding out hope, when the client has lost sense, has lost sight of it, and as Manu is saying, offering some container for the um, the disorientation. And I've already said, but I'm going to repeat it again. I find that this is an act of intimacy. It's where we, um, if you like, reach into and touch um, some of what we might describe as the existential or the challenge at the soul level um, in the individual. Which is why, speak generally, if as a coach or an educator, we choose to interrupt the life of the other, my view is we better damn well know who it is that's doing the interrupting. Um, and I think that touches on some of your earlier questions about groundedness, um, and, um, and that there's something quite physical about that groundedness. Again, to pick up on your question earlier, Manu, um, it's not an intellectual activity. Um, it's knowing that our feet are firmly on the ground. Um, so I speak of, um, I speak of soil as well as soul. Um, that uh, sometimes when reference is made to the soul, it can, um, in terms of its place, it can be up there, it can be in the clouds, it can be um, separate from the ground, if you like. And for me, I want to suggest uh, that the concept of soul is, is tied to a sense of soil. Um, and I appreciate I may be speaking more conceptually here than um, practically. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to my story a bit. Um, so what Howells talks about in terms of the levels of competency, or in fact, maybe I should just interrupt myself, sorry, and make the link with discounting. Um, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that you, you, you're familiar with discounting as a concept in TA, that it's, it's the way in which individuals can ignore or play down the value of something in themselves or in others or of the situation. And what I notice here is that um, in that position of unconscious incompetence, we are discounting the existence of the problem. Whereas when we shift now into um, the unconscious, uh, sorry, the conscious incompetence, we are beginning to account for the significance of the problem. Um, and for some of us, and including myself, um, this can bring about uh, a very clear passive behaviours, um, a desire to discount again. I, I just wanted to go back to London where I had come from. Anything, anything other than having to face the impossibility of herding sheep. Um, so when you think about the client that you've perhaps been talking about with your partner a few minutes ago, yeah, I'm wondering whether or not you might be at a point with the client where there is some level of discounting at the existence um, or significance. And that one of the, and a, a, a reason, a way of making sense of it is that they are um, risking accepting um, the implications of ignorance, of not knowing. Um, and that's, that's a real pain in the neck um, to have to do because um, if one accepts it, then what we are opening the door to is this next stage of becoming um, more consciously competent. And that involves some hard work. Um, and this, if I go back into my, my little story here, is... Um, what happened for me is that I was then embarking on a process of learning to be a shepherd. And this takes um, 
as all learning does. This takes cognitive, it takes effort, it takes um, a great deal of thought and planning, it takes some degree of organization, and it takes rehearsal. We have to pretend for a while to be competent. Uh, we have to imagine, as I did, I have to imagine what it is like to be a shepherd. I needed to get myself the crook, a shepherd's crook. I needed to get myself a dog and start to train my dog. I needed to start to get sheep hurdles. I needed to think about where to position myself, how to build the hurdle yard and so on and so forth. This doesn't just happen. Um, this involves um, practice and it involves the acquisition of information but also skills as well. Again, this isn't a purely intellectual activity. Um, the, we learn with our bodies. Um, we bring ourselves into the learning. And uh, I know, obviously, with my talk about um, farming, it seems quite obvious that there's a physical dimension to it. But I want to suggest when we're working with a coach, uh, when we're working with students, we're always doing it in some kind of place, whether it's a particular room, an office, whether or not it's in the open, um, in the open air. And context and place makes a difference. There is a physicality. And there is also the somatic experience of learning or being coached. And I wonder how often you are mindful of that in yourself, of what your body is like when you're working with this client, but also whether or not you're curious about how the body of your client is in this process. Um, so I want to make a, a link here between um, the, the work we do, if you like, often, even, even on, in this online process, there is a tendency for it to, to, to rise up and stay at a kind of up, uh, cognitive process. Um, but I, I'm wanting to, even, even as you're sitting now, there will be some kind of bodily experience of this process. And for some of us, we might be quite at comfort right now. And some of us may already be agitated because there's this desire to be animated, to move and to experience. And that the value of this as an educative experience might be slightly dulled uh, because of that. Um, and so what I'm really wanting to um, emphasize here is that becoming more competent involves an embodied engagement. Um, and as I say, my story, it's obviously physically engaging, but um, I don't want to, uh, if you like, uh, suggest that um, the experiential pathway only counts for when we're doing physical work. Um, and, and again, this is linked to the reference to groundedness that some of you mentioned, um, is that uh, if we're wondering how to become grounded with our client, um, then I would ask you first and foremostly to consider what you're doing with your body. Um, if you're wanting to be grounded, to ask yourself, how, are you, how do you physically position yourself? Where are your feet? Um, and um, how, will you, how will you enjoy the comfort of your position with your client. Because if, if, you, if you are feeling a degree of agitation, then managing the necessary uncertainty that comes um, with being grounded um, is, is, going to be, is going to be even more challenging. Um, and I've, I've used, it's interesting that I, maybe you, you heard me use that word uncertainty and grounded in the same sentence there. Um, and I think that when we're, we're working with clients, um, there's this, this paradox, really, and it's, it's something which I write about within the paper. It's, on the one hand, having some certainty, being grounded with the possibility of growth, and yet, on the other hand, not having a clue as to what that growth might look like. Um, and it's, that's the paradox, I think, that comes with groundedness. I need to just stop for a moment because uh, I'm wondering how, how you, you're doing here, whether or not there's any questions coming up. 
or, or, or they don't have to be questions. It could be something that's resonating with you or um, some connection with your practice. No? Is this? Hello? Seren. I may be driving, but I'll be in the meeting. I, I'm going on. All oh, right, right. Okay, okay. Thanks, Seren. Okay, right, right. Cheers. Yep. Anybody else, though? I'd like to speak. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah. Um, I've just relocated to the UK, and all the stuff that you're talking about resonates with me completely. Because, right. um, you know, never mind about my client. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can feel all of the stuff in terms of moving into conscious, uh, conscious incompetence, in terms of getting myself organized, settling, doing what I have to do. Mm. And it's, I'm, I'm so pleased that you're doing this talk today because it's really clarifying for me what's happening and clarifying for me what I'm needing. Um, and it's very real. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> right. Oh, thanks for that connection, Sharon. Okay. Thank you. Um, and when you, you mentioned there about you know, moving to the, the UK, it reminded me that there's another parallel with, uh, or oh, sorry, a parallel with another TA model, which I guess some of you may be familiar with, and it's Pam Levin's um, cycle of development. Um, and that uh, there is, a, I think, a loose connection between um, the stages of, of being or belonging um, and the, the containment that's needed uh, with, the, uh, with the client when they move into this unconscious, uh, from the unconscious to the conscious incompetence. Um, and if we notice this is a process that we're involved in ourselves, then my encouragement would be to find somebody who will contain the discomfort and hold out hope for when we doubt. That this, um, this is something we can, uh, if you like, construct for ourselves. Um, if we if we are more knowing about this and I think Sharon it's so important that you recognize this in yourself first um, than than with the clients um, and of, and of course what what we might be able to do to really become that that sort of really effective practitioner is is by um, help help use using our process as a resource and that can be modeling something to the client about this is potentially manageable. I can relate to this either as an overwhelming out of control or um, I, I, I don't have to be, uh, a, if you like, a slave to the, uh, the weakness. I can voice vulnerability and, and have this managed. Um, yeah. I wish I had known that. <laughs> um, I wish I had known that. Yeah. Um, any other uh, any other connections, comments, questions at this stage before we look at the the next stage? I'm going to talk again, if I may. Um, I, I'm, because what's what's coming to my mind is you know my 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 own absolutely experience you know of that at various points and just thinking of the um, you know how I turn to meditation you know, as something within myself to be able to help me, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to do that even right now, you know, sort of intensify that practice. So that, remember, I was talking about the feeling and the thought. Yeah, I, I, yes, and then yes, Having yes. to get to that other place and being able to hold myself as I go into, you know, a world which can sometimes be a bit, you know, it can be scary for me, you know, actually just going into that physical world and taking that kind of action um and 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 meditation being a route for right. that as containment so i was wondering yeah any more, yeah, yeah i'd like that. to man and and during whilst you guys were talking about your clients i was um thinking about how i wanted to respond to some of your comments earlier and this was precisely one of them um is that i think that the the whole interest in mindfulness um 
offers one, one response to how we might become grounded. However, oh, and in transactional analysis, um, there has been some writing about the link with mindfulness, the integrating adult. Um, some of you might be familiar with um, Keith Tudor's work and Susanna's Temple's work on functional fluency and the integrating adult. Um, I, can, I can obviously recommend both of those writers and those models. And some writers, uh, Martin Wells here in the UK, uh, but also Ken Meller, have written about the overlap between the interest more generally in mindfulness and meditation and the, um, the qualities of the integrating adult. But I, I have, it's not so much I have a, uh, a reservation about meditation and mindfulness. Indeed, you know, I practice it myself. Um, what I think I'm, I'm pursuing here, um, and it's not, I think, explicit in that particular article, but certainly in some of the, the writing I've been doing more recently, is I've wanted to be, uh, let me try and, one of, the, one of the concerns I have about mindfulness and meditation is that it tends to um, accentuate partly the individualism in the practice. So it is about me connecting to myself. What I notice it lacks, or there is insufficient emphasis on, is me in connection with others. So it, it can inadvertently, I think, individualize me um, from others. And when I say others, I mean not just um, the human world, but the non-human world. So I have, um, I have an interest in taking meditation outside um, and sometimes taking meditation outside in movement so that, um, so that I, you know, I'm not only focusing on the mind and what's going through the mind, but that the body is there as well. So as you can probably hear, there's a, a strong underlying theme of embodiment in, in my interest here. Uh, so I want to instead, yeah, I'm not, I'm not talking about an alternative to meditation. I suppose what I'm wanting to do is, is create further levels to it, to, 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 to widen the octave, if you like. Um, and I think this has been really important to me um, in the general theme of groundedness. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so Ken Meller and Keith Tudor, uh, sorry, uh, Martin Wells, are two writers in TA. The other thing which is relatively new in the TA literature, and it's something which I hope to, to contribute to myself, but it's just started to creep in, is reference now to eco-psychology. Eco that there is now an understanding, um, or beginning of an understanding, to link what we've understood as human psychology with a psychological model of um, our ecosystem. To tie in, if you like, some of, the, um, some of the aches, the ruptures, the desires and hungers that we might have as individuals, not just in connection with um, our fellow humans, but also on behalf of the planet to some extent. Um, and, and for me, and again, this, were I writing the article now, um, I would be um, drawing much more on um, indigenous, um, indigenous knowledge, indigenous uh, ways of seeing the world. And I, I think, because um, the paper was written some time ago, I think it was a, a time in my life that I was only just becoming aware of the the possibilities of, of um, being indigenous. Um, and, and, you know, indigeneity is essentially um, about speaking from a sense of place. Um, again, you know, a, another, another dimension of groundedness. Um, and, and what I realise only in retrospect now is that David, who was a very old man, had learnt himself 
through a very, very old culture here in the UK. He, he hadn't been trained as a farmer in agribusiness. Um, his own childhood uh, or his own apprenticeship had been from a very young child in um, a very different way of farming that belongs to a very different time. And what I only realize now in retrospect is that it was somewhat of an indigenous education that I was experiencing. I'm really privileged for that. Um, so um, as you can see, in the, in the, uh, if we're sticking with Hal's model of, of competencies at the moment, um, we have this period of great activity where we are acquiring all of the, the, uh, the skills and the knowledge and the challenge for the coach or the educator now, if we're wanting to help cultivate our client, is to have the, the, uh, the, the necessary stamina um, whilst the client practices again and again and again. Um, whilst we, we may find, I find this personally when I'm working with people going for CTA exam, how many times I need to explain the same thing about the preparation for the exam or the written exam. Um, that um, there's a great need for patience, um, the clarity in um, how we uh, share information, um, for the encouragement of the acquisition of new tasks. And of course, mistakes are made. And it's that classic thing about you can learn from your mistakes is so important um, for the client at this stage is to, um, to, to not experience the shame that can come from mistake making. Um, uh, because that can then return us to that earlier stage of uh, a sense of incompetence. Um, and so certainly for myself, you know, I found myself going to bed at night thinking about where I needed to stand, where I needed to put the hurdles and so on and so forth. It's a time of great busyness. Um, and exhaustion as well. And if I just return to, um, to the, the work of uh, Petruska Clarkson, um, the Achilles syndrome, um, and I think this might um, resonate with some of the work you do as coaches, is that she noticed in her work with very high flying um, uh, managers and leaders, she noticed that a recurrent theme was that they frequently were worried about being caught out. That at some point they would be um, caught as the great pretender. That people would find that they didn't really know what they were talking about. Um, and what Clarkson does, and I think this is really insightful, is she notices in their history of learning their particular profession, what happened was that they were often very ambitious very charming, very, uh, very attractive personalities, and they got promoted very quickly. And uh, what they um, often did was that they, they jumped um, this uh, period of developing conscious competence. Um, that they, they didn't actually put the hours in, and they at some level knew this so that they um, um, constantly looking over their shoulder to see whether or not they were, were going to get caught out. And, and so she associates this with the, um, the, the implications of shortcutting this period of competence, uh, competence building. Um, and, and so if, if you bump, you know, I found this quite useful working with clients. Um, that uh, where, where I hear this concern they have of uh, they fear that one day they'll get caught out um, is to start to encourage them, if you like, back into some really core uh, CPD for themselves um, to, to do some of the spade work that, uh, that's necessary at this stage. Um, I'm just going to pause for a moment um, because this is, this is in, in terms of TA and the discounting and accounting model, this is where we're really getting exposed now to the potential of, um, 
of, of uh, strategies, of options, of technique. This is, this is where we are really uh, keen to, to start to integrate that into our, into our own learning process. Can I just check out if there's any, um, any resonance or questions or confusion at this stage? Or, or not? Is this still coherent? I have a, I have, so this has been playing in my mind for some time. So the, um, the overwhelming feeling that you get when, when you suddenly feel things are out of your control or this liminal space sort of an experience where you do not know what the outcome is. Mm, at that point in time, I feel um, compassion and kindness to yourself is very critical. And that is exactly what is lacking at that point in time. Um, <laughs> so that, that is my personal experience in, in, in being able to com be compassionate enough and to have that trust enough, to have that groundedness enough mm. to hang on and uh, move on. Wow, you've put so well, put so eloquently, Rosemary, yeah. So, um, I, I, I really appreciate you using the reference to uh, liminal, the liminality. And I think that's also wrapped up in this, uh, in the work that we're looking at today. I, I, yeah. I really want to endorse that, Rosemary. Yeah. And the liminality, um, which for those of you perhaps aren't familiar with the word, it means threshold. Um, and it's that in between two, if you like, concrete certain places. Adolescence, for example, is a, a fantastic example of liminality. Um, I'm, I'm also looking out the window. Um, the process of weaning, uh, which is a, this, I don't know if you're aware of this, it's this English word of um, um, growing away from the, uh, the mother, um, which I know we'll be doing in a few months' time. Um, each of these liminal processes are necessary in terms of growth. This uncomfortable though they may be, and they're so uncomfortable, we can get to the point that we doubt that growth is possible. Um, it, it can sometimes be felt as keenly as that. Um, so to find compassion for oneself in that, Rosemary, is, um, is such a, an important goal, but also it's often what we resist most. Um, so it's, uh, if we can develop good habits for ourselves and, and share those with clients and, and meditation may be one, I think also being in nature is another important one. Um, and, 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 and also being in relationship, um, are, are different sources of this power. Oh, I mentioned, pa yeah, I, I, yes. Um, I think, um, it was a Alex earlier. I don't know if Alex has had to leave now. Um, but it's a real shame if he has. Uh, but I suppose he can watch the recording. So this bit is particularly for Alex. Is when um, Alex was wondering about how this can be brought within our practice uh, or, or had some thoughts about it in practice. Um, groundedness is one of the sources of power that the late Claude Steiner wrote about. Um, in a, a really interesting article about personal power. And what um, Steiner was looking at there, he was looking at this um, to some extent in relation to leaders. Um, and I use it particularly when I'm talking about psychological leadership, that there are different sources of power, um, which can include the capacity to control others and situations. Um, and that of course can lead to competitiveness and divisiveness. But Steiner also talks about other sources of power, for example, passion and love. But he talks about groundedness um, being one of the sources of psychological leadership or, or power in psychological leadership. That sometimes we will follow people, not because they uh, can control things, but because they have such a, a groundedness. We know that we're safe with them. They don't even even have to say anything. They're just in the room and we know we're going to be okay. Um, 
and uh, that can be something really for those of us that are inclined in that in that direction we can we can um, really treasure that um, as being one of the reasons why we are we are really good enough to lead um, and take on leadership um, so I wanted to, to to make that link with groundedness and power um, I, I, I really find that um, an important article that's uh, one of uh, Steiner's he, he wrote a TAJ article on uh, seven sources of personal power um, if you're interested in that um, um, yeah so so yeah and and there's compassion as well in that article uh, which links with with Rosemary's comment there um, yeah because there's also I, I don't know Karen I don't know whether or not this is going to happen in other discussions you have or the, the couple you've had but I could just I just want to go off on a, a another tangent but I, it feels as though that would be misbehaving um, so, uh, but I, I wonder if that's going to be the nature of these seminars, really. Um, yeah, I think each is going to have its own life. So right. go okay. and feel the flow is going. Uh, well, okay. This is just a slight this uh, a slight digression, um, but it's um, it it relates to a Tibetan um, a, a Tibetan tale. Uh, in fact, yeah, this is the reason why I'm saying it because um, I, I think that for many of the clients and many of the education systems that we're working in there certainly speaking here in the UK but looking at it globally there is there is quite a lot of disruption and disorientation and um, I'm, I'm really aware of a uh, uh, the the uh, the image of a, uh, uh, a the, the Shambhalic warrior uh, that comes from a Tibetan tradition um, a, t a story of where the the a kingdom was in great disarray um, and was at great, great danger of, of collapse. And um, what was required at the time were uh, a new kind of warrior who had only two uh, particular um, weapons, if you like, in order to, uh, to, to combat the, uh, the deterioration and disorientation. And these warriors came from very ordinary places they wore no particular uniform or insignia, but they had these two things. Um, one of them was wisdom, and the other was compassion. And uh, it was uh, on the back of those that the kingdom was saved. Um, and so I just I was prompted there by Rosemary's observation. And I think um, some I think at times um, when I'm considering how to be grounded. In addition to that embodied and uh, uh, that very kind of somatic connection, um, I also like stories. And for me, the, 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 the figure of the shambhalic warrior appeals to me as well. Um, so it connects me to something which is a, a bit more than systems and protocols, but, um, but story and legend. Uh, find that as a, that can be another encouragement for me. Uh, but yeah, that did feel a bit of a diversion there. Um, I'll just talk about this final stage in this model as House has been describing it and um, he talks uh, about how there comes a point where we no longer need to be thinking so intentionally that those skills um, and knowledge that we've been busy acquiring and practicing have become more incorporated or accommodated within us. Um, and certainly now we're lambing at the moment. Um, when I need to be moving the sheep around, um, I do just tend to go out and open the gate and send my dog out. And I'm not too sure now quite how we do it, but um, he brings them to me. Uh, we put them in the pen. Uh, he sends them out. Uh, if any escape, I can get and go over to my neighbors and he'll bring them back to me. Um, the, the need to think this through and practice is uh, less intentional. That there is a, a point where we become unconsciously competent. Um, and uh, we are in a position of what might be described as that place of flow. Um, where 
there's a real sense of the realizing of our potency. Um, there comes a danger, there is a caution there because what can sometimes happen is the context changes and those old skills no longer work um, and we can get caught back into the unconscious competent, uh, incompetent place. Um, and um, there is uh, another dimension to it. If we're the coach or the educator and we're a very experienced coach and perhaps we're very experienced in the field that we are uh, coaching in, we may have forgotten just how far the distance is um, when we're a novice. Uh, we can forget um, all of the painful evenings, uh, the sleepless nights that we had over managing teams or leading in a period of change and so on and so forth. We just do it now. And particularly for those that have been in a, a, a company for a long time or a school for a long time, we may have forgotten what it is to be the new kid on the block. Um, and so sometimes being unconsciously competent can have a degree of, uh, if you like, uh, it can be a bit of a, a blind spot for us. Um, and, and so uh, that's, uh, that's, that's some of the, uh, the responsibility that comes with this. Um, I am um, partly mindful of the time. Um, I, I feel as though I've been responding along the way to the questions around groundedness. Um, but I'm, I'm aware that there was uh, um, Savannah's question about responsibility, which I'd like to come back to, but also Tomoko's question, particularly around the, the learning, um, the learning reference to the learning theory. Um, what I'd like to do though, rather, because the, the danger is that I could just talk for the, the, the rest of our session. Um, and I think that it might be, uh, I feel as that might be appropriate just to give, uh, um, maybe no more than say maybe just five minutes Karen to go back into the original three and to just check out has this been helpful at all in throwing any light on the clients that you were talking about um, are you able to to weave in some connection um, just for, for five minutes if that's all right Karen okay. um, is that yeah. you completed your instructions Yes, yeah, 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 yeah.
quite. I've just clicked the um, information that the groups will be ending in a few minutes, so they'll be joining us. Okay, that's good. It's uh, obviously so frustrating not being around people. Interesting. Yeah. Hey, you've got to trust that stuff's going on in the breakout rooms. Yeah, yeah. Um, and even within the, the main group, 